Hey, welcome back. Um, I hope everybody had a nice lunch. And I'm opening the third session of our first day. And um, I'd like to invite Shira Wilkoff. Shira specializes in transnational history of modern urbanism and, and the spatial disciplines with a focus on environmental thought and the Middle East. She received her PhD in architecture and urban history in 2017 from UC Berkeley. Shira is currently a Spinoza postdoctoral fellow at the University of Haifa, where she's preparing a book manuscript on mid 20th century uh, professional transnationalism using the case of Zionist Israeli planning as a distinct encounter between Central European modernism, British imperial planning, and Zionist settler society. Shira. Good afternoon. Okay. In 1955, a young architect named Arthur Glickson wrote, the worldwide interrelation of environments is a new fact which has emerged in our own time. By accepting this situation, we might arrive at the formulation of a new aim for the man-environment relationship. I um, start with this observation because it captures a new sensibility that emerged during the immediate post-war period, linking the new international world order and ecological awareness on a planetary scale. After 1945, high modernist developmentalism, based on modernization, industrialization, and human mastery of nature, reigned as the leading paradigm for building a new, peaceful, and prosperous future. Leading, but not absolute, as against it, there emerged an alternative vision for post-war development, focusing on environmental viability as key for securing the future of humankind and democracy. And Glickson continued, in vast areas of the world, man has become a pathogen, a disease of nature. And there is a high degree of probability that when the host, that is nature, dies, so does the pathogen. Thus, he concludes, a revolutionary attitude is essential. Glickson, I argue, was part of a group of internationalist scientists, intellectuals, and policymakers who, by enlisting new structures of international governance, sought to redirect the planet off a trajectory that was leading towards catastrophe. In this new spirit of one world, the environment has been made global, a single interconnected system in need of governance. Increasing scholarship has turned to exploring this internationalist moment as a missing link connecting between the more familiar terrain of the pre-1945 nature conservation movement and the emergence of environmentalism as a mass movement in the late 1960s, 1970s. These studies reveal how UN agencies, most notably UNESCO, fostered new kinds of environmental knowledge and exchange. These hubs served as hotbeds for creating an alternative environmental worldview to the extent that they produced, as environmental historian Arthur Junt argues, a starkly contrasting, competing vision to mainstream development in economic growth. Now, while much work has explored the scientific, diplomatic, and legal networks that were part of these new forms of international governance, one crucial group, I argue, is glaringly missing, high modernist architects and planners. Yet, it is precisely this group that produced perhaps the most far-reaching ideas on how to mobilize a new environmental trajectory for modernity. This group gravitated away from the dominant architectural discourse of the modern movement, enamored with the emancipatory power of the machine. Instead, they turned to emerging environmental nodes, especially to the UNESCO-affiliated IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. 
While modernist architects focused their limited environmental, environmental interest on design elements within the built environment, such as climate and energy consumption, and a lot of that was part, of, of course, of the um, so-called tropical sciences and the colonies, this group focused on matters of large-scale planning and the broader impact of human settlement on ever larger spatial tracts. Enlisting both their technocratic zeal and especially the practical experience gained in post-war developmental projects, they began producing, large, uh, they began producing land use schemes for a total reorganization of the relations between nature, society, and economy. For the first time, environmental anxieties over the post-war future, from overpopulation to urbanization to air and water pollution and loss of biodiversity, were articulated and treated by high modernist urban experts. Instead of growth at all costs, they emphasized limits, carrying capacity, and the need for a renewed alliance with the natural world. The cumulative effect of this overlooked, overlooked constellation of actors, networks, ideas, and activities amounted, I maintain, to no less than an alternative environmental path for modern society. Um, from today's perspective, this trajectory is, of course, of special interest. Scientists of the Anthropocene mark the year 1945 as the onset of the Great Acceleration, a historical turning point from which human imp impact on the Earth has exponentially accelerated, creating, to quote, to quote McNeil and Peter and Gelke, the most anomalous period in the history of humanity's relationship with the biosphere, end quote. Within just a few decades, planetary ecological systems have become dominated by the accelerating pace of energy use and greenhouse emissions, all being side effects of post-war development and progress. Now, the fact that this unheeded environmental path was being formulated precisely at the moment in which humanity has hastened its powers of destruction highlights how we can read this tale as a history of failure and unrealized opportunities. So what we'll do today is a foray into this unexplored constellation that you can see in the background, which is part of a larger project that I'm working on. I'll focus on the group that's centered around the IUCN in the middle, and the first part will cover their intellectual and institutional origins as well as their ideas. The second part will delve into one concrete model project, an OECD plan for the island of Crete. The IUCN was founded in 1948 at the initiative of UNESCO's first director general, Julian Huxley, an evolutionary bio biologist and a longtime conservationist. For Huxley and his friends from the interwar environmental movement, the new internationalist spirit after the war signaled a turning point for the movement. Tapping into the new mechanisms of the international world order, conservation was no longer an elite niche, but a central issue on the, on the global political agenda. The interna internationalization of nature conservation came along with a profound scientific re reorientation within the field. A shift was occurring from the tradition concerned with individual species or national parks to ecology conservation, namely a focus on ecosystems and resource management. With new insights derived from the emergent field of economy, uh, ecology, uh, they argued that species could only be understood and protected when their habitats were also understood, and that in a world dominated by the human species, humans had to act to maintain ecological balance. The IUCN soon, soon emerged as a main international conservation organization after 1945. Based first in Belgium and later in Switzerland, it became a magnet for environmental critics of mainstream development, engaging leading conservationists and ecologists such as the American Lee Talbot and the British Max Nicholson. At first, its efforts focused on typical scientific activities, including international data collection and standardization, as well as providing educational programs. For example, during the early 1950s, the IUCN first conceived of what became perhaps its most famous enterprise, 
the Red Book of Threatened Species, which still continues also today. It's published annu annually. And in 1961, it contributed to, these, to, establishing, uh, to the establishing of the World Wildlife Fund, the WWF, as its fundraising agency. Yet it soon became apparent that this kind of activity lagged far behind the rapid changes occurring in, uh, occurring in the early years after the war. In face of moderniza the modernization boom that was sweeping the world, the IUCN people understood that they were losing time in the struggle against environmental decline and the loss of species and habitats. As a result, the IUCN sought to adopt a proactive approach towards development. As one of them put it in the early 1950s, their challenge was to find a way, quote, to link the protection of nature to the development of the environment and economic growth, end quote. But it was only until 1957 that a subcommittee dedicated to development was actually set up, the Committee on Landscape Planning, and within several years, it became a permanent committee within the IUCN. But to do development, you needed to speak the language of development. And that entailed a different set of skills from those at the disposal of the scientists and conservationists at the IUCN. So from the onset, this committee was occupied by a rather unusual group within the landscape of conservation, modernist architects, planners, and landscape architects. These practitioners were drawn to the possibilities of creating a cross-disciplinary environmental task force and linking innovative ecological knowledge with their design practice. Their high hopes, however, soon dashed, and this committee operated in this original form until the early 1970s. Despite its initial intention, it failed to overcome disciplinary divisions within the IUCN, not least because of the scientists' cold shoulder. As a result, it operated as a quasi-enclave of spatial experts within an otherwise body of scientists and conservationists. Their work, nonetheless, remains an unexplored site for bold experimentation with post-war environmental possibilities. So the concept of landscape planning signaled a new field of spatial policy, ecologically minded land use planning. The idea rested on a distinctive professional tool, land use planning or zoning, a technique aimed at the rational spatial organization of all key human activities within a given area. What had originated in the turn of the century industrial city as an urban expertise had, by 1945, emerged as a public policy expertise at the national level, utilized in large-scale social and spatial engineering programs. In practical terms, key land uses, such as residence, industry, recreation, transportation, and agriculture, were organized within a comprehensive plan. It was this attempt at the total rationalization of space and the social and economic relations embedded therein that gave spatial practitioners their distinct technocratic utopist thrust. By introducing the idea of landscape planning as a new field fusing land use technique, ecology, and society, the committee went a step further than standard professional practice. Its comprehensiveness trumped conventional practice of land use, which limited its focus on human society and its needs. And in the field of ecology, it signaled a path beyond the limited geographical scale of protected ecosystems and biotic communities on which ecologists usually focused to include an integrative outlook on human-nature relations on a global scale. Or, in their words, The special care of landscape planners is to see the landscape as a whole and coordinate the diverse, specialized land uses into a healthy, balanced landscape. To do this, they must reconcile the machine age into the organic scale and the field of human activities with the needs of wildlife. 
Core members of the committee all held key roles in modernization projects in their home countries. They were part of a young generation whose formative professional experience had been forged in the context of wartime and post-war reconstruction campaigns. Very early on, late 1940s, maybe early 1950s, they realized separately that standard development pattern, patterns would lead humanity towards an inevitable catastrophe, as one of them put it, and sought instead to find global solutions to reverse the trend. Within the founding core, these four members were especially influential, but there were other co-founders from both the Global South and the Eastern Bloc, such as these two below, and you see them below, I don't know anything about them. I'm still in the process of learning the extent of their contribution and how the uh, global power relations were embedded within the group's dynamics. Um, perhaps the most uh, dominant figure was the committee's chair, Rolf Bentham, a senior landscape architect in the Netherlands and the Netherlands State Forest Service, who at the time was leading major land reclamation projects. In the background was a centuries-long Dutch tradition of flood control and land reclamation, which came to a peak during the post-war period as part of massive state-led operations. Bentham and his team were given the task of planning completely new man-made regions in the reclaimed lands. Also influential were Sylvia Crow and Brian Hackett, who were among the most prominent landscape architects in post-war Britain and played key roles in national reconstruction. Crow, for example, had been appointed a consultant to the Central Electricity Generating Board, in which capacity she was engaged in developing Britain's energy infrastructure, nuclear power plants, transform stations, power lines, wires, and the like. In 1958, she published a book, The Landscape of Power, where she warned against the irreversible damage to the natural ecosystems. And Hackett was also an advocate of ecological planning and especially of the idea of landscape planning. Um, the final uh, influential founding member and perhaps the most far-reaching theorist was Arthur Glickson. He was a German-Israeli architect who was part of the Israeli New Towns team, also known as the Sharon Plan or Ayarot Pituach. And as the regional planner of Haifa in the Northern Valleys in 1948, he tried, albeit with very little success, limited success, to incorporate into Israeli planning environmental principles such as climatic considerations, soil conservation, and the criteria for site selection for the new towns. His pilot project was for the Jezreel Valley, which he conceptualized as a self-contained ecosystem. You can see it here, the Jezreel Valley plan, the ecological plan. His failure within the Israeli context led him to turn to the international arena, where he soon emerged as an expert on ecological planning. However, his sudden death in 1966 at the age of 55 brought to an untimely end his ascending career. The American public intellectual, Louis Mumford, who was a close interlocutor of him, for instance, Sein Glickson, quote, a leader of his generation, end quote. And by the way, just to complete the story, um, his only apparent success from the Jezreel Valley plan was the establishment of a neighborhood of Afula, Afula elite, a neighborhood which supposedly was ideally located in terms of the valley's ecosystem. So that was an ecological um, experiment in Israel. Now, the IUCN, this group believed, provided the institutional backing they needed to develop the new field of spatial policy for worldwide dissemination. Planning agencies of any scale, from the urban to the, na to the national to the supranational, would implement its simple and practical tools, and in this way, a web-like coverage of ecological land use plans could potentially be extended to cover the entire planet. Dreams aside, in reality, they had very little impact. One of their immediate ongoing concerns was the attempt to interject their, their thinking into powerful uh, environmental, developmental UN agencies, such as WHO, the World Health Organization, and FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. They demanded time and again that landscape appraisals be a prerequisite for approving financial and technical support of development projects, but to no avail. 
beyond the UN, they were part of a broader environmental, environmentalist international exchange, which included cross-organizational activities, study tours, and conferences. These, att these attempts are now being reconsidered by scholarship as forerunners of environmental thought, but in real time, they were largely ignored. So, for example, the conference Man's Role in Changing the Face of the Earth, held in Princeton in 1955. Co-organized by Lewis Mumford, this attempt was intended to create a momentum for a new transdisciplinary framework for the global environmental predicament. It brought together top-tier humanists and scientists, as well as some of the IUCN architects, wh whose high hopes for this endeavor were soon dashed. However, they had more success with the OECD. In the early 1960s, the OECD emerged as a key actor in the global aid market. In 1964, the OECD and the government of Greece launched a 10-year development plan for the island of Crete. The plan was commissioned to an Israeli planning team as part of the opening of the global aid market to new, to new actors be, beyond the main powers of the global north. Already by the, the mid-1950s, Israel has established itself as an international model for nation-building and rapid development, and its experts in engineering, urban planning, architecture, and agriculture um, were quick to lend their services to the global south and the backward portions of the southern Europe. So on, this is exactly the context of the Israeli air conditioning in Nairobi. This is, this is a context. So in Crete, um, the same Arthur Glickson was charged with developing regional planning and tourism as part of the larger Israeli development scheme. Given a free hand, the project presented him with a singular opportunity to realize his environmental ideas within the context of a concrete policy scheme under the auspices of one of the most important international aid agencies. OECD's stated goals for the project were promoting economic growth, mitigating regional inequalities within the island, and preventing world decline. Glickson responded to these market-driven goals by devising a plan that focused on balancing, be balancing between modernization and the preservation of the island's highly developed rural culture. In contrast to standard modernist plans at the time, geared toward prof profound transformation of the land and the creation ex novo of modernized, industrialized landscapes, Glickson's plan offered but modest changes to the existing environment. It was what we like to call it today an acupuncturist intervention. It sought a different path to modernization, one that would, com would be compatible with existing environmental and cultural qualities. In devising this model plan, Glickson signaled to his fellow architects into the international aid community, a different path to modern development is possible. And this is how. So how did it play out? The settlement component, the fundamental element of every plan, was based on, on the already existing rural and urban network. Uh, you can see it here, it's, it's very clear. Industrial and agricultural development was to take place around already urbanizing areas. Clear boundaries demarcated the growth limits of those areas designated for intense human use. These are the big circles. Uh, this is in order to prevent a uh, sprawl into the open lands, which were to cover the majority of the island's area. These cities were to be connected by a new road system, you see it here, uh, providing efficient and convenient means for connectivity befitting a modern society. The plan suggested neither any new towns nor new regions for human settlement. And here is the mirror image of the development plan, the preservation scheme for the natural areas. The preserved area was a continuous strip cutting across the entire island with several narrow ecological corridors located along watershed lines. Conceived of as an ecosystem, it required careful study, planning, and administration of its interconnected components. Principles of ecological management, such as soil conservation, selective native plant afforestation, and water management were all incorporated in order to protect and enhance the local landscape. Within this system, Glickson planned a Cretan trail, which would serve as a backbone for the entire island's natural areas, it's the uh, big, the lines, basically the black lines. 
Um, this project was inspired, of course, by the American Appalachian Trail, initiated by Benton McKay, one of the leading American conservationists, and Glickson and McKay had an ongoing exchange over this uh, Cretan plan. Based on the preservation of the island's, uh, of the island's scenic landscape, international tourism was to serve as the economic backbone for earning foreign income. And indeed, the plan detailed, gu uh, the plan detailed uh, guidelines for mitigating tourism's negative impact on the local landscape and culture, controlling its spatial circulation, etc. You can see it here. This proposition, in effect, undermined the economic underpinnings of the overall plan prepared by his Israeli compatriots. Their plan was based on mechanization, industrialization, and especially the shift from family farming to exportable, large-scale agriculture. Glickson found the latter particularly devastating for the island's tradition and nature. So, in other words, he showed an alternative path to participating in the global market, one which monetized the protection of the natural world and questioned common catalyst, catalyst, catalysts of development. These ideas may seem obvious today, but then they were almost heretical. And indeed, this plan was ultimately submitted to the OECD as a dissenting report, given its dissonance with the overall Israeli scheme. Yet for reasons not entirely clear, this plan was actually endorsed by the OECD, and in the following year, in 1965, Glickson was commissioned once again, this time to guide the implementation of his ideas. However, his untimely death in 1966 buried his initiative altogether. Unrealized, it remains a singular experiment by which a market-driven international agency served as a platform to challenge the very ethos of economic growth and to explore instead an environmental path for modern development. So to conclude, and in hindsight, this forgotten trajectory was a clear forerunner of the field of sustainable development for all the obvious reasons, in incorporating the natural world into plan in planning and its demand from the UN for ecological appraisals as a prerequisite for plans, and in developing acupuncturist planning strategies. As such, it serves in effect as a laboratory of proto-sustainability, prefiguring much of today's debate on and within the more applied, solution-oriented approaches to the Anthropocene. But more broadly, what would have happened if landscape planning had been adopted by powerful UN developmental agencies and somehow had become the binding global planning standard? I dare to propose not that much. Um, like today, architectural interventions were pro uh, like today, architectural interventions the, the, an architectural intervention would probably only serve to mitigate the detrimental effect of business-as-usual global capitalism, making the spatial impact a bit more bearable, adjustable, adjusting here and there. These modernist planners saw in spatial organization and land use planning as a transformative tool that could actually revolutionize society-nature relations. But this stood no real chance against humanity's addiction to fossil fuel, meat consumption, car use, and consumerism. As such, it ultimately could have done little to prevent the processes of global warming, a phenomenon far beyond their ecological and catastrophic imagination. Yet, as a road not taken, it opens a window onto the historical contingency of its moment by showing that there were various possible courses of action, multiple options to choose from. As such, this story differs in one major aspect from other cases of environmental what-ifs. That This is not a story about a technical or scientific turning point with destructive but unpredictable results. Rather, rather it is a story about a conscious decision made by the international community to ignore environmental options at a particularly crucial moment. And as, as such, it is a tale about human decisions, emotions, and reactions, about knowing, yet at the same time denying impeding catastrophe. A tale all too familiar today. 
The mid-20th century road chosen is the one on which humanity continues to march today at an ever-accelerating pace. The various courses of action of that previous planetary threshold invite a new historical imagination of the nuances and possibilities both then and today.